morning. It's, it's wonderful to see you all. This is, this is our fourth year of our partnership with the Smithsonian to do this series on intelligence and espionage. And uh, every year, I have to say, we get a bigger and bigger turnout, and I'm not sure what to do about that. Uh, anyway, welcome to all of you. We're delighted you're here. I'm Peter Ernest, the executive director. And uh, as a courtesy to the speaker, if you'd be kind enough to turn off your, uh, uh, your cell phones and other recording devices and so forth. Very much appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, let me just touch on a couple of quick things uh, before we start. One is, some of you may have noticed in the back of the room, there is a display of the compound at Abbottabad, uh, where the raid was conducted that, that uh, brought down, as the President said, brought Osama bin Laden to justice. That it, those are photographs of the actual compound model used by the CIA in planning the raid. Uh, the representatives there are from the National Geospatial Agency, not from the foundation, but from the agency itself. So I think they, you may well find them interesting to speak, to talk with uh, after the program uh, is done, and they will be there through that. Uh, our speaker will be here uh, afterwards also to sign books. Today we are very privileged to have I consider one of the absolute top authorities on the subject at issue here. And the subject of issue, of course, is not simply the person of Osama bin Laden, but the organization he founded, Al-Qaeda, and the movements associated with it. Uh, as you know, this is a very lively issue as we speak here today. The, uh, the issue is very hot. There was a white paper that was leaked from the Department of Justice or made available, however you choose to word it, uh, explaining the justification of, of uh, targeted killings, uh, or if we're not going to be too Orwellian, assassinations. Uh, as you know, that has been a very lively subject in our country by the people uh, who are concerned about these issues, which should be all of us. In addition to that, of course, tomorrow are the confirmation hearings for the appointment of John Brennan as the director of CIA. He has been the president's advisor for four years on terrorism and intelligence matters. So that also is very lively as an issue. Uh, so that said, uh, Peter Bergen, our speaker today, uh, is a well-known and very respected uh, print and, in, and television journalist. He currently is the director of the National Security Studies Program at the New America Foundation here in town, a research fellow at New York University's Center on Law and Security, and CNN's National Security Analyst. In uh, 2008, he was an adjunct lecturer at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, and he has also been an adjunct professor here at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins. He has had uh, many uh, contributions to the field of public knowledge uh, on Osama bin Laden, on Al-Qaeda, and on the Al-Qaeda movement. Uh, in 1997, as a producer for CNN, he produced the, bin Laden, the first television interview of bin Laden and the first time he declared war on the West. Peter Bergen was part of that uh, interview and actually did interview uh, ben Laden. He has written a number of books on the subject under discussion today. I might say his most recent is Manhunt, uh, which we have here. Uh, to finish on Peter, uh, this is his latest book. Uh, the other books he's done, The Longest War, uh, Osama Bin Laden, I Knew, Holy War Inside the Secret World of Bin Laden, have been all, virtually all New York Times bestsellers. They have been recognized and put in for awards, and in most cases, a, a, a TV documentary has been made of them. He's currently, by the way, a member of the National Security Preparedness Group, which is a successor to the 9-11 Commission. So at this time, and considering the nature of the subject, we could not have a better speaker. Please help me welcome Peter Bergen. Okay.
Thank you, Peter Ernest, for the introduction. Thank you to the Spy Museum uh, for this invitation. Thank you all for coming today. So, you know, it's interesting that the second in the series of these talks is how the Mossad captured Eichmann, uh, because as I was <clears throat> thinking about the hunt for bin Laden before he was captured, I started read Neil Bascom's very good book on, on the hunt for Eichmann. And I think one of the takeaways from that book is that, you know, you can hide, but as human beings, you're likely to make a mistake, um, which will eventually lead to your being found. And that's not always the case. After all, Mengele, uh, the angel of death at Auschwitz, uh, probably died in Rio de Janeiro in a drowning accident in 1970, I believe. But in the case of Eichmann, he must have thought that he He'd done a pretty good job of disappearing. As you know, he lived in Argentina um, for many, many years. But what gave him away was his, as I recall, his, his son uh, was sort of boasting to his girlfriend that his dad was sort of an important Nazi. And she communicated this to her father, who then called a friend of his who was a judge in Germany who had an interest in hunting down Nazi war criminals. Somehow Mossad got uh, hold of this information and went into Buenos Aires and, and as you know, kidnapped uh, Eichmann and brought him to Jerusalem to stand trial in 1962. So the reason I mention all that is in the context of the hunt for bin Laden, <clears throat> people at the agency started looking at other manhunts for, you know, because they basically they, they didn't have any clues about where bin Laden was. So they were looking at sort of broad lessons of other manhunts, and Eichmann's certainly was one of the manhunts that they, they examined. And I, you know, one of the big lessons here is that you know, family may be the key to finding a fugitive. Often fugitives don't take their families with them. In Eichmann's case, he did. And in bin Laden's case, he took three wives and a dozen kids and grandkids, which is not a sort of typical uh, kind of thing that a fugitive would take with him. So, you know, long before bin Laden was captured, I was interested in the hunt for bin Laden. I was very aware that the hunt had basically, it, you know, had basically, there were no leads. I mean, I, in 2003, I talked to people involved in the hunt for bin Laden, and they said various versions of, you know, the trail has run cold, we've hit a brick wall, we just don't have anything. And I was increasingly convinced over time that that story remained true. In fact, in 2010, I wrote a piece for the Washington Post basically saying the lead, you know, the hunt for bin Laden has, you know, it's going nowhere. Well, unbeknownst to me, and, and only known to a very few people at the CIA and the White House, the hunt for bin Laden had actually sort of begun to pick up in August of 2010. And of course, we all know the outcome of the hunt. And when I started to sit down to write my book about the hunt, a, I had rather limited time uh, to write it in and report it, uh, which actually was good because I think it kind of gives an energy to the whole book because you know, I didn't have an, a luxury of saying, hey, can I take another year, which I've done in past books. Um, I sat down on May 2nd or May 3rd and thought, you know, what are the big ideas that need to be communicated in this book? What are the big questions that people would want to have the answers to? <clears throat> And I thought there were five or six sort of themes that needed to be addressed. You know, obviously, what was bin Laden doing after 9-11 was kind of a big theme. And of course, much of that was hard to sort of disentangle. How was Al-Qaeda doing uh, after 9-11? Uh, and to what extent was bin Laden involved in directing them? The Agatha Christie story at the CIA about how bin Laden was found and as a sort of sub part of that, to the extent to which coercive interrogations were or were not useful in the hunt for bin Laden, uh, coercive interrogations by the CIA. The evolution of Joint Special Operations Command, uh, the special forces, essentially Delta Force, US Navy SEALs, uh, the helicopter uh, special operations um, army helicopter regiment, um, and because it's not at all clear that in 2002 that the operation could have gone as relatively smoothly as it did with the special operations community at that time. The evolving nature of the US-Pakistan relationship, because as you will recall, US-Pakistan relations in the time period that the, <clears throat> the raid on Abdabad happened were at an all-time low. Um, and also, 
obviously, you know, President Obama as a decision maker, because at the end of the day, he made the decision. And so, I mean, I begin the book, uh, you know, there's a problem trying to tell a story that everybody knows the end of. <laughs> And so I was trying to think, how do I begin the book in a way that might sort of draw people in and be a little unexpected? And so I begin the book with what was Bin Laden, what was Bin Laden's life in like in Abdabad in the five and a half years he was living there? What was his life uh, like on the run as the world's most wanted man? And the picture of it you develop, and I was able to actually get inside the compound where Bin Laden lived before I, I didn't know it was going to happen. Two weeks later, the Pakistanis demolished it. I was the first outside observer to, to get in to look at it. The, the picture is, you know, Bin Laden has always been a very um, careful with money. Uh, like, a, like a lot of, not, well, like some children of very rich families, he's always been pretty careful with money. Um, but he was also running out of money during this time period. So money was tight. I examined the gas and electricity bills for this compound. They were paying maybe $50 a month. Uh, in a compound that has 24 people in a place that is quite cold in the winter and quite hot in the summer. There was no air conditioning. There was very rudimentary heating. Bin Laden's three wives, uh, the oldest wife, Korea, who's from Saudi Arabia, has a PhD. She was uh, 62 at the time of the, uh, in 2011. She had recently done a fairly extraordinary thing. She'd been living in exile in Iran. In 2010, she traveled from Tehran through Waziristan to Abdabad to rejoin her husband, who she hadn't seen in nine years. Uh, that's a 1,500-mile journey across some of the most, most difficult terrain in the world. Uh, she's described as a pretty tough uh, customer. The other wife was the 54-year-old, also Saudi PhD, um, bin Laden's uh, third wife. Uh, she was also living in this compound. And then he was young, his youngest wife, the Yemeni, who was 29 at the time, uh, Amal is her name. She had married bin Laden when, he was, when she was 17, and he was, I believe, 44. And he had described her as a, um, to his other wives, as a you know, highly educated 30-year-old. Well, she turned out to be a sort of uneducated 17-year-old, uh, and there was a little bit of tension at the beginning. But at the, <laughs> in the house, they all lived in some sort of a relatively harmonious life because all the wives had signed up for two things that most people ne wouldn't necessarily sign up for. One, they all signed up for a life married to a jihadi war hero. That was their motivation. The oldest wives married bin Laden in the mid-80s when he was already developing the reputation as a war hero fighting the Soviets. And the youngest wife married bin Laden um, a couple of years before the 9-11 attacks when he was developing a reputation as a sort of global jihadist. And that was one of the key motivations they had for marrying him. Also, all these wives were second, third, fourth, fifth wives. Uh, so they all went into the marriage knowing it was a polygamous arrangement. And in fact, not only knowing it was a polygamous arrangement, but believing that this is sanctioned and, and desirable uh, according to God. So they lived in relative harmony. They were growing their own crops in the house, in, in, the, in the compound garden. They were raising cattle for milk. They were raising chickens for eggs. They were raising, they had bees to make honey. It was a kind of, um, you know, pretty self-contained, which of course had a security aspect to it because they didn't have to go out that much uh, to get things. Uh, you know, occasional trips to the doctors when the kids got ill. Um, and they were buying some household products. I noticed, for instance, in bin Laden's bedroom that, um, he had a just for men hair dye, Pakistani version. Uh, so he, they were, and he was dyeing his beard, and he was now in 54 and, 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 and quite vain about his public appearances. And so they were occasionally going out to buy things, but they were mostly able to live in this compound without going out. And of course, bin Laden never, it not, didn't, it's not only that he didn't leave the compound, he very rarely left the second and third floor of the main house. He would do occasionally, he would take a walk in the garden. But even then, it was under a tarpaulin that prevented uh, satellites from getting a clear picture of him. So he was being very careful. And he built the house in such a way in 2005 that it was designed to prevent easy surveillance from almost any angle. Uh, bin Laden lived on the third floor. He had basically his bedroom with his youngest wife, 
a tiny toilet about the size of this lectern. Uh, it was one of those sort of squat toilets, so not nothing very you know sophisticated. And then a, a small kitchen. Um, and then next to that was his study. And he had uh, windows in the study which gave onto a terrace, very small. Uh, but the terrace had seven foot walls, so you could not see in at all. You also, by the way, couldn't see out very well, which on the night of the raid would prove a problem for bin Laden. And so he'd created this sort of prison of his own making. Uh, it was designed to make sure that people didn't know he, he was there, and it was pretty successful for some period of time. His days were spent, um, his, his uh, bodyguards, the courier, uh, you know, would print up stuff off the internet. Bin Laden would spend many of his days writing, in one case, a 46-page memo to his chief of staff in Al-Qaeda. Um, he would uh, be reading, ironically, a, a, a number of English books. One of them, a book that he actually publicly said he really enjoyed, was written by Mike Scheuer, who, of course, ran the Bin Laden unit at CIA. And uh, Mike Scheuer wrote a book called Imperial Hubris with this sort of basic premise that the Bush administration was, well, I think the title speaks for itself, and too pro-Israel, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Bin Laden was reading these kinds of books in English. He was composing these lengthy memos to Al-Qaeda. He was lecturing his family on religious matters. Um, he um, was watching Al Jazeera. We, we know from those videotapes, he was watching old sort of video of himself on Al Jazeera. Um, and, you know, it was a confining uh, existence. On the other hand, for the world's most wanted man, it was not a bad life. And he was with his three wives and a dozen kids and grandkids. And um, I don't think that he ever expected that he would be found. Which brings us to the question of how was he found, <coughs> which is a long story. <laughs> it begins with... Um, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti was the alias of the courier who was bin Laden's courier. And <clears throat> it didn't require great acts of inductive logic to realize that bin Laden was relying on a courier network. Because, and just to give you a few examples, after 9-11, bin Laden released 30 videotapes, at least 30 videotapes and audio tapes, mostly audio tapes. These audio tapes and videotapes would often go to Al Jazeera's bureau in Islamabad or Al Jazeera's headquarters in, in Doha. Uh, not all of them. Um, the ones that went to Islamabad were physically taken there by a particular person and handed to Al Ahmed Zaydan, who was the Al Jazeera bureau chief. And this happened on two occasions, once in the late 2002 and once just before the presidential election in 2004, US presidential election. So clearly, there were people physically taking these tapes. This was not something you needed to be in the CIA to, to understand. Ahmed Zaydan, who I interviewed for a multiple number of my books and who spent a lot of time with bin Laden, um, you know, he, he was very public about the fact that you know, he was in a car park and he, you know, he received a sort of call and said, you know, come at a certain time late at night on a Sunday and we're gonna, we have something for you. And it turned out to be a bin Laden audio tape or a bin Laden videotape. So bin Laden was communicating by couriers. Now the CIA, um, in 2005, a female analyst wrote a memo, basically, you know, it, it, it was called, um, it, it, it had a title that I'm forgetting for one second. It, it, it had basically outlined, it was called Pillars. And, and basically said, you know, given the fact that we don't have any real information about where bin Laden is or any really good leads, we need to kind of go back to basics, and we need to think about on what pillars are the hunt for bin Laden going to rest. And the pillars were four. Bin Laden's communication with the media, including Al Jazeera. Can we trace back the chain of custody of these tapes back to bin Laden? Um, bin Laden's courier network in general. Bin Laden's communication with his family. And bin Laden's communications with other leaders within Al Qaeda. And most of these things didn't really pan out. Uh, the, they could never trace the chain of custody back from a particular Al Jazeera delivery to bin Laden. Bin Laden's immediate family was either actually with him, therefore not needing to communicate with him, or they were not, if they were in Saudi Arabia, they were not communicating with him at all. And communications with other leaders of Al Qaeda, never, there was nothing that was intercepted that could ever lead back to bin Laden. So it really became in, in what General Mike Hayden, the former director of the CIA, uh, calls a bank shot. 
with the bank shot would be you find the courier and then you find bin Laden. So it was a matter of trying to assess who was in the courier network. Now the first time Abu Ahmed al Kuwaiti's name uh, seems to have been mentioned, what's available on the public record, is in the, and by the way, WikiLeaks was very useful for this, uh, for the discussion I'm about to give you. Uh, because WikiLeaks, you know, WikiLeaks there are the hundreds of thousands or millions of documents, some of which are, you know, merely because things are secret doesn't mean they're true. Um, and so, and much of it is sort of undigested raw intelligence and, but what is particularly useful uh, for an account uh, like this is in the WikiLeaks sort of dump, there were the, the summaries of the interrogations of people held at Guantanamo. And these summaries summarize, you know, sometimes, you know, hundreds of uh, interrogation sessions of one detainee. And of course, not, in the, all, not all the information may be true, but a lot of it is quite interesting and some of it is true. So in the case of um, <clears throat> one particular detainee, um, and you can see this yourself if you go out after this uh, session, if you're interested in looking at it, the detainee that first seems to have mentioned the courier, at least his alias, maybe not his role, uh, was the real 20th hijacker. Now the real 20th hijacker was not Zacharias Musawi who was tried in Alexandria, Virginia, and it was in Minneapolis in Minnesota sort of taking flight lessons and making kind of a spectacle of himself in the pre-9-11 time period. The real 20th hijacker went to Orlando Airport in the summer of 2001. His name is Mohammed al Qatani. He's a extremely uneducated, a very, very unsophisticated Saudi. In fact, so unsophisticated that he continues to believe, even as an adult, uh, that, the, that the, um, the, the sun revolved around the earth. Um, so he, uh, he was not a sophisticated guy. He was basically contracted by Al Qaeda to be the 20th hijacker, one of the muscle hijackers who would restrain the passengers. He was likely going to be on United Flight 93, which crashed in Pennsylvania. If he'd been on the flight, maybe that would have turned out differently. Anyway, an INS officer, um, when Katani came to immigration, there was something suspicious about his story. Uh, this guy didn't speak English. He didn't. He had a one-way ticket. He had very little money. His story about what he planned to do in the States didn't add up. And so the officer said, sorry, you have to go back to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and this Mohammed al Qatani got all enraged and said, I'll be back, and, and, and it was sent back to Saudi Arabia. He then went from there to Afghanistan. He was at the Battle of Tara Bora in December of 2001, where bin Laden also was. He crossed the border into Pakistan on December 15th. He and quite a number of bin Laden's bodyguards were picked up by the Pakistanis. They were then handed over to the United States and they were then sent to Guantanamo. So in Guantanamo, Mohammed al Qatani initially said that he was in Afghanistan because of his keen interest in falconry, which was not, of course, true. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he, uh, he, he was, and at a certain point, they connected Mohammed al Qatani the fingerprints of Mohammed al Qatani to the angry young man in Orlando Airport who was going to be the 20th hijacker who'd been sent back. At that point, he became the subject, obviously, of intense interest from interrogators, and he was subjected to a series of uh, coercive interrogations that Susan Crawford, who was a federal judge appointed by uh, Ronald Reagan and then was appointed to run the military commissions at Guantanamo by George W. Bush. Uh, said that his treatment amounted to torture and he could never be tried for anything. And just to give you a sense of the treatment, he was kept up for, and this by the way was, this is a rare example of actual coercive, or the only example of coercive interrogation techniques at Guantanamo. Usually they were in, they're in CIA secret prisons rather than the military uh, detention camp at Guantanamo. Anyway, he was kept up for about 44 days straight. <coughs> I mean, he was given time to sleep occasionally, but he was more or less continuously interrogated, he was subjected to cold, cold and heat, he was, uh, he was uh, stripped naked in front of females. Uh, when he was falling asleep, he was treated to some especially annoying track by Christina Aguilera. And he, uh, anyway, he, he, was, he was definitely abused. Um, and he, uh, he um, and he, by the way, the FBI, which uh, was uh, monitoring some of this, you know, um, an FBI official wrote a, a note to headquarters saying this guy is being pushed over the edge. He's having delusions. He is, 
uh, cowering in the corner. He seems to be having some sort of paranoid schizophrenic breakdown. So the FBI, which was always against these techniques, um, <coughs> objected and also said that this guy is, uh, you know, being, being abused in a very serious way. At some point, and it's not exactly clear when, the 20th hijacker, Mohammed al Qatani, said, the person who trained me on operational security is this guy called Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, which means the father of Ahmed from Kuwait. Um, and that's the first time that the U.S. government uh, came to realize that um, Kuwaiti played some kind of inner role in al-Qaeda. Um, now, Peter Ernest mentioned John Brennan's confirmation hearing tomorrow. Uh, Dianne Feinstein, who will be leading, you know, who's the head of the committee, has publicly said that coercive interrogation techniques did not prov provide the leads that led to bin Laden. And as you know, the Senate Intelligence Committee has been doing a three-year investigation of this question. They've written a 6,000-page report none of which has been declassified, although some of its key findings have been publicly explained by Senator Dianne Feinstein. She says that there is no evidence that coercive interrogation has led to bin Laden. And I believe her for two reasons, or three reasons perhaps. First of all, I think Dianne Feinstein is a very serious individual. It's extremely unlikely that she would say after, and it's been a very thorough investigation. Now, certain people in the CIA say, look, we, this, this investigation hasn't been fair because you haven't talked to the officers involved. I actually think that's actually the wrong way around to look at it, because I think documents tend not to lie or, or forget. And if you look, it's, it's really the documentary record that is necessary here, who said what, when. Uh, and you can get some of that from WikiLeaks, but obviously the stuff that is yet to be declassified uh, can really give you the kind of um, the exact chronology of who said what and when. Because each of these interrogation reports is dated. And you can see in the WikiLeaks uh, interrogation summaries that every interrogation summary is, is dated and, and named in some way. So from what's available in the public record, it's not clear if Kuwaiti said this, if, if, if Kuwaiti's name came before or after these coercive interrogations. But I think it will become clearer, and, and certainly to Senator Dianne Feinstein uh, says, uh, that this kind of information came out previously previous to coercive interrogation techniques being used. Although there's a caveat here because the interrogation I'm describing actually didn't happen in a CIA secret prison, it happened in Guantanamo. Anyway, su suffice to say the issue is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little complex, particularly when so much of what we need to know remains classified. And if there's any, you know, Peter Ernest, before we just had this, uh, before I came on the stage, we were talking about Zero Dark Thirty and the extent to which, you know, it's put this issue back into play. And I think Zero Dark Thirty is a you know, extremely good piece of film. Um, I'm not sure it's a particularly good piece of history, since it will give uh, most viewers, I think, the impression that coercive interrogations were critical to the finding of bin Laden. They were certainly part of the history of the war on terror, but that's a separate issue for about that then. Were they really useful in the hunt for bin Laden? We will know more. We may even know, know some more tomorrow, because I think one of the questions that Senator Dianne Feinstein is going to ask Brennan or, or Senator Ron Wyden uh, or somebody is, What's your opinion about how useful coercive interrogations were? And in particular, did they help in the hunt for bin Laden? Because there's no, probably no official in the US government who was more involved in that hunt than John Brennan himself. Um, and I think that will pose an interesting moment for Brennan because he, he's in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee and the, the leadership of which has said that the, these, these interrogation techniques were not useful in finding bin Laden. Yet he's going to be taking over an agency where quite a lot of the people in, uh, who work there think that these interrogation techniques were useful and may even be useful in finding, finding bin Laden. So it'll be interesting to see what he has to say about this issue. Returning to the story about the hunt. Um, so al Kuwaiti, Ahmed from Kuwait, is regarded as somebody important within al Qaeda. But, you know, there are millions of people from Kuwait, and lots of them have kids called Ahmed. So Ahmed from Kuwait is not a particularly helpful, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's a beginning. But it's not, it's a very long way from where you really want to be. In 2004, a guy called Hassan Ghul um, was arrested in Iraq, and he's a Pakistani citizen who was carrying a letter uh, between the leaders of al-Qaeda in Iraq and the leaders of al-Qaeda in Waziristan, or in Pakistan. Essentially, he was a letter from Abu Musab al-Zakawi to bin Laden. And the letter basically was saying, we need to start a sort of sectarian civil war in, in Iraq, 
uh, in order to get the Sunnis to kind of rise up and kind of join us in, against the Shia. Um, and unfortunately, that project worked out all too well. Uh, but Hassan Ghul uh, was arrested, and he was taken into Kurdish custody. And at some point, again, not exactly clear when, um, he said that, and then he was taken to a CIA secret prison where he was coercively interrogated but not waterboarded. He said that Abu Ahmed al Kuwaiti was one of bin Laden's couriers. So this is really the first time that you have an association of this guy with the courier network. Around the same time, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the operational commander of 9 11, and his successor, Abu Faraj al Libi, who was also captured in 2005, both said that Abu Ahmed al Kuwaiti wasn't important or, or had retired from Al Qaeda, which is an unusual kind of, not many people usually retire from the group. But um, so, and of course, that made Abu Ahmed al Kuwaiti of more interest to the agency because at the end of the day, they knew that he was a player in Al-Qaeda. The fact that KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and his successor were sort of waving them away kind of increased their interest in this guy. Now, in 2007, the agency found out the real name of the courier. And the real name of the courier was Ibrahim Saeed. And he wasn't Kuwaiti. He was a Pakistani whose father, who had emigrated to Kuwait, and like a lot of Pakistanis, was sort of second-class citizens in Kuwait, could never get citizenship. Um, and so this made him particularly interesting to al-Qaeda's leadership because he'd grown up in Kuwait, spoke, spoke Arabic fluently. He also came from the northwest frontier province in, Af in, in Pakistan, which, of course, is where al-Qaeda was then you know, headquartered uh, and was a Pashtun and could speak the local languages and blend in. So he was, in a sense, the perfect courier for bin Laden. Um, and he also had known he'd been part of al-Qaeda since in, in the pre-9-11 time period and was somebody they trusted completely. So in 2007, it's not exactly clear how, but I think the Pakistanis gave the name to the agency, and I could never really nail this down. Um, they had a real name, Ibrahim Saeed, but again, this is sort of a John Smith name. It's not an alias, but it's a lot of, you know, 180 million people in Pakistan, twice the size of California. It's still a long way from finding bin Laden. And then, and I, there are parts of this story that I don't know the, we're going to keep finding out about. In 2010, Ibrahim Saeed, the courier, Abu Ahmed al Kuwaiti, made a phone call to somebody in the Gulf uh, saying, you know, how are you? And the person in the Gulf said, are you with the people that you used to be with? And there was sort of a pregnant pause, and he said, yes. And then, and that was the sum total of the conversation. That conversation, which NSA or National Security Agency was listening to, and it's not clear if they were listening to Saeed or the guy in the Gulf or both or what prompted their interest in this call, um, kind of confirmed to the agency a couple of things that were very important. It confirmed to them something they weren't sure about, which is they, they weren't completely sure that this guy was still in Al-Qaeda. And this phone call seemed to indicate that he was. Secondly, it, um, they were able to geolocate this phone call to Peshawar, Pakistan, which is a city of several million people in Western Pakistan. But the courier was practicing very careful operational security. Not only was he f turning his phone off an hour away from where he lived, he was also taking the battery out. So um, the, you really can't track a phone with the battery out. And so Peshawar is two and a half hours drive from Abdabad, where bin Laden was living. Um, and so at a certain point, the agency put people on the ground uh, to follow this guy or put a tracking device on his, on his vehicle when they could locate it in Peshawar, Pakistan. And eventually, it led them back to this relatively small Pakistani city of Abdabad, which is about 4,000 feet above sea level. It's sort of a retirement community for retired Pakistani military officers. It's, as you know, the site of Pakistan's West Point, the Pakistan Military Academy. It is a... Um, quite a pleasant place. It has a very nice golf course. Uh, it has views of the mountains. Kind of feels, looks, looks a little bit like Bavaria, perhaps, with, uh, if you kind of squint a little. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and it's sort of a tourist destination. I mean, you know, and it, people stop off there on the way up to the Karakum Highway to China. Um, it's a def tourist destination for Pakistanis escaping, you know, the kind of heaving, hot summer 
uh, Pakistani cities like Karachi or other cities. And in fact, when um, Leon Panetta goes, the CIA director goes to the, uh, the, the Oval Office to brief President Obama about this, um, he, he, he describes it basically a little bit like a retirement community in Virginia uh, to the president, so 30 miles outside um, and uh, outside the capital. So in August 2010, Panetta briefs the president, he briefs the vice president, uh, John Brennan, uh, Dennis McDonough, who's now the chief of staff, and uh, Tom Donnellan, the national security advisor. And this is a very small group of people. <clears throat> and basically he says, you know, we think we have this lead on, on bin Laden in, in Abtabad, but it's a, you know, it's a circumstantial lead. Uh, there's a circumstantial case he's there. There's no evidence. And people are not high-fiving at all at this point because, if you recall, just a few months earlier, uh, arguably one of the biggest CIA you know, kind of failures that happened in host in eastern Afghanistan where the best lead they'd ever had on Ayman al-Zawari, now the leader of al-Qaeda, turned out to be a uh, Jordanian double agent who wasn't working to expose Ayman al-Zawari. He was being, being recruited by al-Qaeda and conducted a suicide operation in host which killed seven CIA employees and contractors on December 30th, 2009. And so people were well aware uh, when Panetta came with this information that other lead, promising leads had ended very poorly or just simply not panned out. I mean, there was so many times, you know, the agency in, in, the, in the initial years had lots of Elvis sightings, which they had to sort of, uh, you know, follow up. And uh, there was a, you know, every time a story popped up about bin Laden, it had to be sort of chased down. But over time, the agency became more and more convinced that he was living in Pakistan, that he hadn't gone to Yemen or some other country. And here was Panetta explaining <clears throat> the case about why bin Laden was living in Abtabad, which was really the case about the courier that I've already laid out. So that, became, that began a period of sort of intense focus on this compound and who was living there and, and who, and you know, as time went on, the more and more information about the pattern of life of this, of the occupants of the compound came out. There were three families living there. The third family, uh, there was a, a man who didn't take, uh, who didn't go out, uh, who they nicknamed the Pacer because he would take these uh, quick walks around the garden under the tarpaulin. Um, and it seemed to correspond with what they knew about bin Laden, the number of wives, the number of kids. They did things like observe how many female and male undergarments were on washing lines to get a sense of who was living in the compound. Um, they faced a problem about, they couldn't, do very aggressive surveillance or, or knocking on the door of the compound. They didn't want to spook the inhabitants. Uh, Panetta was, uh, kept pushing for better information. At one point, Jeremy Bash, his chief of staff, went to the bin Laden unit at CIA and said, you, ha you have to convince the boss you're doing absolutely everything in your power to you know, get inside the compound in some way. Come up with 25 ideas. If some of them are wacky, you know, it's fine but just convince him you're being creative. And they came up with a number of ideas, some of which clearly were more creative than others. And one of the ideas was, was to broadcast in Arabic the voice of Allah um, sort of demanding that the occupants of the compound come out. <laughs> and uh, playing on the presumed religious fanaticism of the inhabitants of the compound. Another idea was the, you know, a very simple one, was to throw a stink bomb into the compound and just get people out that way. Those ideas, of course, didn't happen. But one of the creative ideas creative but certainly ethically dubious was to mount a, a sort of uh, false flag vaccination program in Abtabad that would get the DNA of the, the bin Laden kids. Um, as you know, this is a very sensitive issue in Pakistan. We've had multiple, multiple polio workers who've been killed recently uh, because of the, the, the kind of religious fundamentalist view that this is sort of a CIA plot. So unfortunately, this idea uh, kind of played into a lot of uh, kind of Pakistani kind of conspiracy theories. Um, and in fact, it never got the DNA of the kids. I mean, what happened with the, the doctor who was recruited, Dr. Afridi, he started, he recruited some nurses. He then started a vaccination drive in one of the poorer parts of Abdabad in order not to sort of to give this a backstory that seemed plausible rather than starting immediately in Abdabad. Uh, but they never, they never were able to get people inside the compound to come out and, and give uh, 
take the vaccination and acquire the DNA for a potential DNA match with bin Laden DNA held by the um, US government. So CIA uh, you know, was Panetta kept pushing, we need to improve the intelligence picture, and, and, and it, it didn't really improve. Um, it, there was a certain level at which it remained steady, and at a certain point, President Obama, probably by January of 2011, uh, began to sort of move on from the question of, <clears throat> are we going to get better intelligence to what do we need to do about this uh, place? And basically, there were four or five options uh, that were considered. <clears throat> at this point, uh, there were three people at the Pentagon who knew about this, Admiral Mullen, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, James Cartwright, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, and Mike Vickers, who's the civilian overseer of special operations, now the civilian, the lead intelligence official at the Pentagon. At a certain point, he brought Michel Flournoy, who was the undersecretary for policy in, because as they began thinking about planning, one of the big things they had to think about was, what are we gonna do with the Pakistanis? Are we gonna tell them? Uh, how are we going to deal with this? And uh, Flournoy, and also, by the way, parenthetically, you know, if this all goes sort of, if this, is a, if this is a disaster, we need to be thinking very carefully about how we supply our troops in Afghanistan. Almost all our materiel at that point transited by ground or by air uh, through Pakistani ground or Pakistani airspace. And so very quietly, they began developing a so-called northern distribution network, which basically brought materiel in from the former the Central Asian states, the former Soviet Union, and it's a much longer route. Uh, but basically, they wanted, and, and there were sound reasons they could publicly say for it. But you know, we want to like you know, spread our you know, spread our bets here essentially. But the main, the real reason, which was known to Robert Gates, and, and Michel Flournoy, and the, and the handful of people who knew what was going on, uh, was that uh, they needed a plan in case the Pakistanis closed down all these routes, uh, if the Bin Laden raid sort of went wrong in some way. Um, so the Pentagon, Vickers calls uh, Admiral Bill McRaven, the head of Joint Special Operations Command in Afghanistan, tells him to come to the Washington. Says, uh, we need to tell you something. They tell him what they know at the CIA, and they show him a compound, uh, the model of the compound that is uh, that the National Geospatial Imagery uh, Agency very kindly has brought here. And um, McRaven looked at the compound, and the you know he didn't say what he was thinking, which is, if the plan is to bomb this place, that's going to be a pretty big operation. I mean, this is an acre, a compound that stretches over an acre. And so one of the first options they considered was a B-2 bombing raid. Well, when they did the math, it would have been 32 500-pound bombs. James Cartwright, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, pointed out that would be like having a small earthquake in a you know, sizable Pakistani city. And it came freighted with all sorts of problems. You couldn't even prove to yourself that you'd got Bin Laden because the DNA and everything else would evaporate. There'd be no in intelligence collection. You'd be bombing an ally. There would certainly be civilian casualties, not in the compound, but in surrounding areas. And it would have just been, it, that was quickly sort of dismissed as a bad idea. Another idea was a joint operation with the Pakistanis. Now, there had been those in the past. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the operational commander of 9-11, was arrested in Royal Pindi. It was a joint operation between the CIA and ISI and, and the Pak Mill. Um, and, um, you know, that, that went pretty well. Uh, but, of course, relations with the Pakistanis were at an all, you know, basically at an all-time low. You recall that C Raymond Davis, a CIA contractor, had killed two Pakistanis in broad daylight in Lahore who he said were robbing him, and uh, the US government, including the president, said all sorts of false things about who this guy was. It was pretty obvious that this was not a conventional diplomat who you know, was like this very bulked up guy who shot two people in the street. And, uh, and over time, the US government had to admit that actually, yes, he was a CIA contractor. Uh, well, this played into every kind of conspiracy theory and, in fact, uh, well-founded uh, fear in Pakistan that their country is awash with CIA spies. And um, <clears throat> then, of course, the drone program, uh, which was at, at its height in, in 2010. There were 122 drone strikes, the most that have, that have been in anywhere um, by the CIA. And um, relations were at, a, were, were at a low ebb. So Michel Flournoy, who was thinking through what to do about the Pakistanis, you know, there was a serious discussion. Shall we include them? Shall we tell them after the fact? Shall we tell them just before? And at the end, they decided to tell them after the fact. Uh, and in fact, I think for the Pakist Pakistanis were quite annoyed about this, particularly the people who dealt most directly with the CIA and, and uh, the top level. 
uh, the ISI director and the chief of army staff, General Kiani. But I think that in the, if they sort of thought about it uh, later, um, if they had been told, I think it would be problematic for them also because they could truthfully say we had no idea this was going to happen, which made them seem, you know, uh, sort of out of the loop. But on the other hand, it didn't make them complicit in an operation that a lot of Pakistanis didn't like. Not that they liked bin Laden, but they didn't like this sort of abrogation of their national sovereignty in a, in a uh, U.S. Navy SEAL team assault. So the second option of doing a joint operation with the Pakistanis was dismissed. So it became sort of three options. One was a drone strike using a experimental munition that had never been used in combat. No one would tell me about exactly what this was, but I talked to enough people to realize that it was not a typical bomb. The smallest bomb the US Air Force drops is 500 pounds, and the people just, what they were describing didn't kind of accord with this, and I did it. You know, so a little bit of internet research, and it became clear that Raytheon has been developing a, uh, a nine-pound bomb uh, for the last three years, and it seems to correspond very, very much to what they were describing. Um, Admiral Mullen, who spoke to me on the record, um, was very opposed to this idea. He said, we put too much faith in our technological prowess. Uh, this is not the right way to go. James Cartwright, who the, his number two, was always in favor of this option, or at least for the public, who was, he was sort of saying, we can do this. Now, the drone strike had several, it had some downsides and some upsides. The downside, it might miss, uh, which drone strikes, and you can actually hit people with a drone and they don't die. Uh, so there was, there was that. Uh, secondly, there was the um, possibility that it might hit the wrong person. Uh, and, there was also, again, uh, the possibility you wouldn't have the intelligence collection at the scene, um, and you couldn't really be completely certain that you, you'd got bin Laden, and, and, and also this thing had never been used in combat. Um, and then the fourth, operation, fourth uh, option, of course, was the US Navy SEAL operation. And the fifth option, which was always there, was like, let's just wait. Let's just kick the can down the road, try and gather more intelligence, and this is a very natural human reaction to any situation, which is, Let's just wait and see. But there were problems with just waiting and seeing because as you began to operationalize the possibility of doing a raid or a drone strike or anything, you're bringing more and more people into the tent of knowledge. Now, they don't have to know that it's a bin Laden raid, but they know that something's going on. And at the White House, for instance, there was this wonderful, wonderful things. They, they're called, um, they're called non-meetings, which are meetings where there's no minutes and there's no, you can't take a second and uh, the, the, the cameras that are on in the Situation Room are turned off, um, and people were beginning to notice there were all these interesting meetings that they were being excluded from, uh, and clearly something was up. And so, you know, there was a real concern. John Brennan, for instance, uh, began to be concerned about a leak. And if you know what, you know, Dom, Tom Donnellan has famously said, "There's one way to keep a secret in Washington: don't tell anybody." So, but more and more people were being led into this, and so they had to begin planning for the possibility it might leak. Um, and he brought Ben Rose, the strategic communications advisor, in to sort of be able to explain this operation. And they needed also to explain the operation, whether it went well, badly, indifferently. They needed to explain that they f this was a circumstantial case, but it was a good one, at least in their view. Um, particularly if this operation went wrong, they needed to be able to plan for some sort of public communication um, where, you know, SEALs were killed or wounded or taken hostage or there was a firefight with the Pakistani military or civilians killed or bin Laden not being there or some combination thereof, all of which were quite possible. So the final meeting to discuss all this <coughs> um, was Thursday, April 28th at 5 p.m. in the Situation Room. And President Obama went around the room uh, and basically said, what do you think? And it wasn't a vote in the conventional sense, but it was, you know, give me your opinion um, and I'll, I'll make my decision. And Robert Gates, who had been a Stansfield Turner's executive assistant, aged uh, as a 41-year-old case officer, a uh, 41-year-old uh, uh, case uh, CIA official, uh, was in the White House the night that Operation Desert Storm, Operation uh, Eagle Claw went wrong. Um, Operation Eagle Claw, of course, was the botched effort to rescue the 52 American hostages in the you know, embassy in Tehran in 1980. And everything that could go wrong with that operation, as I'm sure you recall, did go wrong. Uh, 
And, and in fact, one of the reasons we have a successful bin Laden raid is because of the lack of success of this raid, because it came it was as a result of this botched operation. The four services all wanted to be part of this heroic operation. They'd never done anything like this together. It was all, in fact, I sat next to uh, Vice President Mondale at lunch relatively recently, and he said, you know, one of the mistakes that we made was it was all so highly secret and compartmentalized. A lot of people didn't really understand exactly, you know, what the operation was. It wasn't sort of, so it was, it, it, people did, they, there were no rehearsals of any meaningful way, manner. The Navy didn't uh, maintain the helicopters very well that were used in the operation. There was a sandstorm. The helicopter and a C-130 crashed together, killing seven American servicemen. It was a complete catastrophe. And of course, it made, it was a contributing, a large contributing factor to President Carter being a one-term president. And now in every meeting that happened, uh, Robert Gates would, would remind people of this disaster. And here was another Democratic president launching a special operations uh, operation on the other side of the world in a country that uh, certainly isn't necessarily a conventional ally. And um, he, he advised against the raid. Now we know from Mark Bowden's book, uh, this was something I had a lot of problem uh, nailing down in my book, uh, which came out, um, I think, nine months before Bowden's book. Um, he, Gates changed his mind, but after the president had made his decision, the president had already authorized the raid. Gates called Donnellan and said, you know, now I'm in favor of the raid. Flournoy and Brennan, Flournoy and Vickers went to Gates the morning, that Friday morning, and said, um, you know, here are the reasons we think the raid is a good idea. But uh, the bottom line is, in the National Security Council meeting where people were giving advice, Gates said no. And, and it was a concern about the, lack, the intelligence uh, that, that bin Laden was there. A red team had recently come in. One of the people on the red team had said there was only probably a 40% chance that bin Laden was in Abdabad. Uh, others said 60%. But at the end of the day, President Obama makes a decision. Bin Laden is either 100% in Abdabad or 100% not. There's no, you know, these kind of, <laughs> you know, these, it's sort of easy to say these percentages, uh, but when you make the decision, you're either right or wrong. Um, and at one point, you know, President Obama asked Mike Morrell, the acting director of the CIA, uh, uh, why are people giving me these different percentages? And uh, Morrell said, look, it's about the weapons of mass destruction fiasco in Iraq. Anybody who was involved in that, including myself, is naturally skeptical of a circumstantial case. People who've been in on the bin Laden hunt for years, they're the people who really are confident that this is bin Laden. And, and, and in fact, Mr. President, uh, Mike Morrell said, in terms of the circumstantial case, there was more circumstantial evidence that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction than there is circumstantial evidence that bin Laden is living in Abdabad. So this is a pretty tough decision. And so the people in the room on the third, that final National Security Council meeting, when the red team came in, which was kind of late in the game, now this had all been red teamed at the CIA before, but another red team came in, and when they're suddenly saying there's a 40% chance, now you know, people are giving numbers where the possibility that bin Laden's living in Abdabad is actually going down as the decision has actually been made. So then, of course, Vice President Biden uh, was against the raid. He had become a senator when Obama was 11. Robert Gates started working in the White House for Richard Nixon when Obama was 13. He'd served every president since. Uh, that's a pretty serious group of people saying, you know, we, don't, we think this, the, SEAL, the SEAL team raid is a mistake. James Cartwright, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, also was in favor of the drone strike. And then on the other side of the room, in term, Panetta was from the beginning in favor of the raid. Admiral Mike Mullen was from the beginning in favor of the raid. He'd actually attended the rehearsals that the SEALs did in Nevada, the final full dress rehearsal where they flew in the hour and a half flight. They had roughly the same temperature, a full mock-up of the compound uh, with one important detail wrong, which was the mock-up of the compound had chain link fencing where the real compound had um, concrete walls. And that is a kind of important detail for what happens the, on the night of the raid. So Mullen had seen the rehearsals. He knew Bill McRaven very well. He made a point of visiting uh, JSOC headquarters in Afghanistan every time he was in Afghanistan. And he was very much in favor of the raid. And that's interesting because usually Mullen and Gates would have been on the same side of an issue, but here they were split. And then Hillary Clinton, who after all was a senator in New York at the time the 9-11 attacks happened, gave a long and loyally presentation of both the pros and the cons, and no one knew where she was going. At the end, she said, I'm in favor of the raid. And for her, I think it was a very <coughs> emotional uh, kind of 
decision. I mean, you know, she, she'd visited Ground Zero on September 12th when it was you know, still smoking. Um, and uh, you know, many of her constituents had, had died in, 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 this, in this attack. And so I published my book on May 1st, 2012. I didn't know that five days later, uh, Governor Mitt Romney would say any president would have made this decision, including Jimmy Carter. And well, Jimmy Carter made a form of this decision, which made him a one-term president. And it's not at all clear to me, you know, Vice President Biden ran for the presidency. I mean, if, if President Biden wouldn't have made this decision, President Robert Gates wouldn't have made this decision, decision. And it's easy sort of ex post facto say, when you know the outcome, I would have made this decision too. But uh, that wasn't at all clear to the people in the room. And uh, as you know, things went wrong. Um, and one of the reasons that the operation worked as well as it did was the evolution of JSOC, which I haven't really addressed in great detail, but the, you know, it's a very different organization because of the work of General Stanley McChrystal and Bill McRaven and um, Colonel, um, uh, General Flynn. Uh, who's now the head of DIA, it's a very different organization than it was in the pre-9-11 time period, a much more, you know, a, an organization that does a dozen raids a night. That for them, the raid in Abdubai, from a technical point of view, was very routine. What well, wasn't routine, it was in a 150, 200 miles inside a, uh, a country which, with which we have tricky relations. So the reason the chain link fencing is kind of important in the rehearsals is when the helicopters came in, the temperature was a little higher than they anticipated. These are stealth helicopters, which have, as far as I know, never been used on a combat operation, which makes them they're, they're heavier. Um, and the <clears throat> when they got at the compound, the, the concrete walls around the compound produced a kind of some kind of wind effect um, that interfered with the stability of one of the helicopters on the raid, which crashed. And it was only the um, the skill of these incredibly skilled pilots who he was able to settle it down in such a way that no one was even injured as, they, as the helicopter crashed. And, and when, a, when a helicopter, I don't know anything about these things, but I'm, I'm reliably informed, when a helicopter loses power, it drops out of the sky like a stone. It's not like a plane, uh, which has some you know, kind of aerodynamic lift. Um, and so obviously well, everybody in the White House, the famous uh, photograph when they were watching this, everybody thought things were going wrong. Bill McRaven said, you know, we're going to have to amend the mission. He was very low key. Um, you know, we planned for this contingency, um, and uh, and you know, they they could see on the from the RQ-170 spy stealth, stealth drone two miles above the compound that people got out of the helicopter, and uh, the raid happened. One of the interesting questions is here is you know, could Bin Laden have been captured, or should he have been captured? And um, this is, by the way, the first question I have. I, I, my book has been published in Danish and Germish, German and Norwegian, and I was on a book tour there. And the first question a European audience has is, why didn't you capture Bin Laden? This is usually the tenth question an American audience has. The, <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, and, and I think it's a legitimate question. And uh, there was certainly a contingency plan for Bin Laden being captured. They had a contingency plan for anything. They had the playbook, which was like this thick, with all the different things that could happen. And there were branches and sequels. So, you know, a captured bin Laden, a captured wounded bin Laden, a captured hostile bin Laden, a captured compliant bin Laden. And there was a uh, team of interrogators, FBI, CIA, high value detainee interrogators at Bagram Air Force Base, Arab linguist lawyers that would have basically taken bin Laden and then he would have been, fl and if, if this whole operation would remain covert, he would have been flown to the USS Carl Vinson, cruising off the Arabian Sea, where he would be later be buried at sea. And he would have been held there for months. And he would have been interrogated, and it's in international waters. And uh, so there was that plan. Of course, that plan never came to fruition. Uh, bin Laden had 15 minutes to surrender, because between the helicopter crashing, which is a pretty loud event, and um, him being killed, it was 15 minutes. He didn't surrender. He didn't put up resistance either. He had two guns in his room, an AK-47 and a Makarov submachine gun pistol. Uh, he didn't reach for them. He didn't do anything. And uh, I'm, you know, unfortunately we can't ask him why not, but, um, he, you know, I, I think the first thing to say is that the um, electricity in the house was off. 
the electricity in the neighborhood was off. You'll see in Zero Dark Thirty, there are all these lights and people, that's completely not how it happened. I mean, obviously in a film, you have to have lights, otherwise you can't. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in reality, it was completely pitch black. Uh, and there was no moon. And of course, that, that was one of the reasons that they had to make a sort of go, no go decision that weekend, because then they'd have to wait another month for no moon. The seals are all wearing night vision goggles. Um, but, you know, it's a confusing situation. There's been a helicopter crash in your house. There was a firefight with a courier. Bin Laden uh, is in a prison of his own making. You know, I described how, it, you know, he could, no one could see in, but he also couldn't see out. And, you know, he may have contemplated that a firefight with the, um, would have killed a, quite a number of his wives and kids, which is true. Uh, it was a very enclosed space. Or he may have been just paralyzed and surprised, which is also true. Uh, but anyway, he didn't put up a fight. Uh, and what does it all mean? Um, you know, it means justice for the victims of 9-11 and their families and the restoration of American national honor on this issue. Um, you know, Al-Qaeda itself was, was doing pretty poorly at the time of bin Laden's death. And there's, uh, there's no better witness for that than bin Laden himself. We've had 17 of these documents from the Abdabad compound have been released by West Point. And they paint a picture of an organization that well understood its pro own problems, Al-Qaeda, Bin Laden was advising Al-Shabaab, the Somali affiliate of Al-Qaeda, don't use the name Al-Qaeda, it's bad for fundraising, you'll attract a lot of negative attention. So he knew the Al-Qaeda brand was in deep trouble. He was contemplating changing the name of the group to a lot of very uncatchy things like the monotheism and uh, jihad group, and he had a lot of other potential names for the group. But he, uh, he also knew they were running out of money. Uh, he was extremely concerned about the U.S. drone strikes. He was suggesting that Al-Qaeda might have to move to eastern Afghanistan, an area called Kunar, which is heavily forested and, and, and very mountainous and therefore a good place to hide from American drones and satellites. He was advocating his, one of his sons, Hamza, to move to Qatar, which of course is one of the richest, is the richest country in the world per capita and also one of the safest. Moved from the tribal regions to Qatar. He, um, he was blue skying about improbable attacks on David Petraeus and President Obama for the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And so these documents paint a picture of an organization, the picture that I had before reading these documents. Uh, you know, it's interesting when people are aware of their own, their own problems and Bin Laden was deeply aware of his own problems. And there's been a certain kind of impetus, I think, with the Benghazi attack of September and the attack on the Algerian gas facility in January to say Al-Qaeda is back, which I think is just completely nonsensical. The idea that somehow an attack on a, it's not even an American consulate, it's a CIA listening post in Benghazi, uh, Libya, that was completely undefended, means that Al-Qaeda, and that four Americans are killed very tragically, that somehow Al-Qaeda is back. I mean, Al-Qaeda killed 3,000 Americans here in the United States in the course of basically one and a half hours mm -hmm. on a Tuesday morning. These things are orders of magnitude different. And in fact, there's been no Al-Qaeda attack in the United States since 9-11. There's been no Al-Qaeda attack in the West since the London attacks of July 7, 2005. Al-Qaeda or groups like it haven't taken over any Muslim country. Um, in fact, most of their affiliates are in steep decline. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula control chunks of southern Yemen. They don't anymore. Um, Jamaa Islamiyah, their Indonesian affiliate, was uh, something people were very concerned about in 2003. They're mostly out of business. Al-Qaeda in Iraq controlled a third of the country in 2006. They're not, they haven't gone away, and they've re-emerged to some degree in Syria, but they're not where they used to be. Um, Al-Shabaab, the Somali affiliate of Al-Qaeda, Al controlled most of southern Somalia. Now it controls, almost not, controls no cities and, and only some rural areas. And um, I mean, I can go on giving other examples, but the point is, is that embedded in the DNA of these groups, Al Qaeda and affiliates and like-minded groups, are the seeds of their own destruction. They kill mus mostly Muslim civilians, which is not impressive for people that present themselves as the defenders of Islam. And that was particularly true in Iraq and well reported in the Arab world. When they come to power, they impose Taliban-style rule on the population. Most people don't want to live under the Taliban. Um, you know, look at what happened in Mali. You know, the French, until relatively recently, Mali was part of their empire. It's pretty unusual for your former, you know, the people that you used to control you to be greeted as liberators, which the French army have been greeted as liberators, and people are dancing and singing in the streets for the French in Mali. Um, so, you know, that shows how the jihadi militants who ban singing in a country where singing is very important and smoking and you know, amputated hands, I mean, how 
This is how they rule. And they did that in Anbar province in Iraq. They did that in, they did that in Afghanistan in pre-9-11. They, they've done that. Wherever they've kind of got power, they'll try and do that. They did that in South Southern Yemen in 2011. Most people don't want to live under this Taliban utopia. Um, and uh, so they kill Muslim civilians. They rule like the Taliban. They have no answers for the real political and uh, economic problems that beset the Muslim world. Um, they may have made a world of enemies. There's not a category of institution, person, or government they haven't said they're opposed to. The UN, the media, every Western government, every Middle Eastern government, every Muslim who doesn't precisely share their views, Jews, Christians, uh, you know, Chinese government, Russian government, Indian government. You know, it's not a winning strategy to keep adding to your enemies. <laughs> and finally, uh, they won't engage in conventional politics. And so they won't become Hezbollah or Hamas. I mean, it's, they're incapable of in, in engaging in conventional politics, first of all, because they think it's un-Islamic to be involved in elections. And secondly, because they didn't do anything. An Al-Qaeda hospital is an sort of oxymoron of the first order. Uh, so they will not engage in conventional politics. All of this is a recipe for either irrelevance or defeat. And you know, the prognosis for these groups is very, very poor. And the death of bin Laden was just a giant punctuation point because he had founded Al-Qaeda 9-11 was his strategic conception, a very bad strategic conception, that an attack on the United States would provoke the United States to move out of the Middle East while we're more engaged in the Middle East than we've been in our history. We have huge bases in Kuwait and Bahrain and Qatar. Uh, we, have, we just found out today that we have a drone base in Saudi Arabia uh, from the Washington Post. Uh, and uh, you know we're engaged in a, a sort of low-level war in Yemen, and we're engaged in Afghanistan. We were engaged in Iraq. So his whole strategy was was a failure. And, and you know after 9/11, a lot of people said this was like Pearl Harbor. Yes, of course it was a surprise attack, and that there was information in the system that should have perhaps been more seriously taken. But it was also Al Qaeda's Pearl Harbor, <clears throat> uh, just as Pearl Harbor ineluctably led to the collapse of Imperial Japan. The 9-11 attacks led to the end of Al-Qaeda, and in fact, ended in Al-Qaeda's founder and leader's death. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a good news story. Uh, it is a good news story. Uh, you know, this group is, they committed essentially a kamikaze attack on the United States. They paid a tremendous uh, price for it. Al-Qaeda means the base in Arabic. They never recovered anything like the base they had in Afghanistan. And they're left with a sort of a kind of mindless strategy that's never going to work, and a tactic which is only violence, and it's a sort of form of nihilism that is putting them on the wrong side of history. Um, and um, it's well understood around the Muslim world that they're not offering anything of any particular value. Um, so I'll take any questions. Go ahead. Do you think there, oh. you think, uh, there was a chance at all to have captured uh, Osama bin Laden uh, in Bora Bora if we, if we would have used conventional US forces instead of relying on the Afghanis? I mean, I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, or, or maybe. I mean, the <laughs> Here is, you know, I get into that in some detail in the book. Again, WikiLeaks was useful because it, it kind of filled in some blanks. I've been to battle, I've been to the, I've been to the site of the battle of Tora Bora twice. I've interviewed, you know, the CIA officers and Delta Force officers who were on the ground. I've interviewed the Afghan warlords on whom we relied, and um, you know, I, and then I, um, I've also interviewed by, by email General Tommy Franks, who was in charge of the operation overall. And you know, what happened was Gary Burnson, who was a CIA officer in Kabul, and his boss, Hank Crumpton, who was the overall special operations commander of CIA operations in Afghanistan, both were <coughs> requested for a battalion of rangers to go in. Now it would have been 800 rangers. Um, and that was denied by, by Tommy Franks. And, and why was it denied? Um, he says, he said in an answer to an email that I sent him, basically, you know, we weren't really sure that bin Laden was there, the intelligence was sort of mixed. That is not, I'm, uh, unfortunately, that isn't the case. I mean, and you can check this very easily yourself. Special Forces have written their own history of the Afghan war, um, which is publicly available. And um, according to the Special Forces history of the war, multiple radio transmissions between December 9th and December 14th, 2001, indicated bin Laden was in, they could hear it. I mean, they, they could, you know, people, people listening knew his voice. There was a CIA guy on the ground who spent six years uh, listening to bin Laden's voice. 
Uh, and you know, Bin Laden was saying, I'm sorry I've let you down, you can leave, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm leaving. Uh, so Bin Laden was definitely that. Uh, Tommy Franks also said, you know, we didn't want to make the same mistakes as the, the Soviets, you know, too many American boots on the ground, and you know, that's a, that was, a, you know. I think also it's very hard for you to call right now, but there was a kind of casualty reverse environment at this time in the US military. The idea that Americans couldn't stand uh, US military casualties, which is very strange immediately after 9-11. The last war that the United States had been engaged, engaged in, Kosovo War, there were no casualties. At this point in the Afghan war, more journalists had died than American soldiers. Four journalists had died and one American soldier, which was a uh, uh, CIA official, which is uh, uh, Mike Spann at, in Mazar Sharif. So it had all gone so well also, you know, this kind of using the special forces and the Afghan warlords to overthrow the Taliban. It didn't work to get bin Laden. At, at now, arguing against that, let's say the 800 special uh, rangers have gone in. You know, Tora Bora, the, ha the mountains rise to 14,000 feet. It's winter, it's snowing, it's December. Um, you know, this is not an area that's very easy to seal. There are multiple mountain routes into Pakistan. So, the, but the reason then, you know, the reason I say maybe is that they, they didn't try. And final point here is there were more journalists at the Battle of Tora Bora than American soldiers, which I think sort of speaks for itself. You could get there if you wanted to. Um, it, it wasn't tried. What about, what about the hunt for uh, bin Laden's number two, Zawari, I think is his mm. name? And, you, and you're preparing notes for uh, your book on that? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, I, I think people would, would be less interested in a book about that uh, because Zawahiri is less important. Um, he's an important figure. Um, he's regarded as sort of divisive, and he's released 27 statements since bin Laden's death, um, none of which I think anybody's paying any attention to. Um, I think he's going to manage what remains of Al Qaeda central into the ground. You can make an argument actually, it'd be good just to leave him there because he's the, his replacement might be worse. Um, but yeah, so. Zawahiri is out there. I'm surprised that he hasn't been found. He was taking many more risks than bin Laden. He's constantly releasing videotapes and audio tapes and books and critiques of other jihadists. And uh, you know, he's a much, he, he was more public than bin Laden, but um, somehow he's managed to escape. He was almost killed in a drone strike in January of 2006 in a place called Demadola on the, on the, in the tribal regions of Pakistan. But um, you know, I'm sure people are spending 24-7 looking for him. Um, but uh, so far, there hasn't been any really good lead. Um, at one point after 9-11, uh, George W. Bush was making a speech and someone asked him about bin Laden. And he, I remember he said he didn't think about bin Laden very much anymore and there are other terrorists out there. And I thought about that the night of May 1st when bin Laden was killed and, and Obama made the speech. and. Thousands of young people came from all over the area in Lafayette Square. People that were teenagers at the most were riding their bikes down to, um, you know, to be to celebrate. And I just the juxtaposition of the president at that time saying he didn't think about him anymore, and then all the young people celebrating. I, I think President Bush did think about him a lot, and he, he what he said publicly didn't mean what what he what he thought privately. I mean, there was very sound reason not to sort of say, hey, you know, the most important thing we have to do is find this guy and our problems will be magically resolved. Or, you know, he, oh, there was a kind of real, I mean, they didn't want to talk about him too much because it was embarrassing they hadn't found him. But General Mike Hayden, who was CIA director uh, for much of the Bush uh, um, presidency, the latter part, said that every morning at Thursday at 8 o'clock he would go in for a weekly meeting with the president and President George W. Bush would look up from his desk and his glasses and would say, how's it going, Mike? And everybody in the room knew, how's it going, Mike, was, how's it going finding bin Laden? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. So, you know, he was very intent on trying to find bin Laden. And in fact, if you look at the last six months of the Bush presidency, the last, in the second term, the drone strikes, I think in the first six months of 2008, there were maybe eight. And in the last six months of 2008, there were 44. And they killed quite a number of Al Qaeda leaders, and they were looking. You know, they basically had given up on kind of getting. They they decided to take the war, kind of sort of back from kind of a joint U.S.-Pakistan thing, and more just a sort of unilateral U.S. Uh, and the drone strikes were designed to try and maybe try and you know, 
either kill bin Laden or his leaders or kind of smoke him out. Um, and and they, I think they were pretty intent on finding him. At the end of the day, the war on terror was really about bin Laden because if there would be no war on terror, if the Taliban had handed him over in October of 2001, the invasion of Afghanistan wouldn't have happened. The Taliban would still be in power probably in Afghanistan. I think the Iraq war would, may not have happened. A lot of things would have happened, happened differently. So I think there was a real focus on getting bin Laden. Uh, they made some mistakes along the way. Uh, Tommy Frank, Donald Rumsfeld never asked Tommy Franks, do you need more people at the Battle of Tarbar? Which as the Secretary of Defense is part of his responsibility. He never solicited from Franks some kind of alternative to what they were doing. And I went back, I looked at the public record of what officials were saying about bin Laden being at the Battle of Tarbar. Uh, Wolfowitz on December 11, 2001 said, we think he's there. Vice President Cheney was on the network saying, we think he's there. I mean, there was a lot of understanding that he was there, but they didn't, I, I think they were so, the overthrow of the Taliban was so successful and so quick that they didn't almost sort of internalize the fact that Al-Qaeda's leaders were at Tarot Bora and were going to escape or, or could escape, and of course they did. Please. Is there any evidence that Pakistani government officials were aware of uh, bin Laden's presence in Abbottabad? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to prove negatives, but I think no. Um, and I thought that even before I started writing the book, based on sort of just logic, which is, you know, I met with bin Laden in 97, and we were subjected to an enormous amount of scrutiny just to do a TV interview with him. Uh, they searched us, they tr followed us, they kind of isolated us. These guys are very paranoid and secretive and disciplined. Um, so it struck me as why would bin Laden clue in people in the Pakistani government about it was just unnecessary. And secondly, you know, Al-Qaeda tried to kill President Musharraf on two occasions in December of 2003. They were at war with the Pakistani government. The Pakistani government was at war with them. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the operational commander, was, uh, as I said, arrested in a joint U.S.-Pakistani relationship in 2003. Um, so it, it didn't make sense that bin Laden would tell Pakistani officials. Now, as I did my reporting on the book, I found out that one of the adults living in the compound where bin Laden lived didn't know he was living there. So he was hiding even from some one of the adults on the compound, one of the wives of the bodyguards that was protecting him, didn't know it was bin Laden. And then we have these documents that have been recovered from the compound, many thousands of them. If there was a smoking gun, a real smoking gun, uh, that indicated Pakistani official complicity, we'd find, we, we know about it now. I mean, it's not like our relations with the Pakistanis are so great that we would keep that a secret. Um, so I'm, I'm not at all convinced that there was Pakistani official complicity. And uh, it's hard to prove negatives, but I, there's nothing that anybody has seen or said that, and I've asked this same question, everybody I interviewed in the book, I asked the same question to. And you know, very senior people in the administration said there was no evidence of Pakistani official complicity. If your last statements of your speech are all true about the feelings of the Middle Eastern countries concerning uh, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, do you see, do you hold any hope that they really might do away with them? so that there might be some peace brought to that region, or at least a little less? I don't think we're going to abolish jihadist violence. I mean, that's, that's a standard which, in every other war that we have fought, we've never said we are going to kill or capture everybody who has these ideas. It's an impossible standard. And there will, jihadist violence has been around since the dawn of Islam. Um, and just think about the assassins who are operating in what is now Iran in the 12th and 13th century, who are sending out you know, assassins from which we gain that useful noun to go and kill their political enemies. So the standard should not be, will these people just completely go away? The Taliban, by the way, in certain parts of rural southern Afghanistan are like your neighbors. I mean, they're not the neighbors I would encourage necessarily, but <laughs> they are, you know, they reflect extremely conservative rural Pashtun social values pretty well. So we're not going to get rid of them either. Um, so, uh, but you know, Al Qaeda is the answer to uh, the Muslim world's problems. I think you know, very few Muslims think that they're the answer. 
the Taliban is, is the answer to Afghanistan's problems. In polling across Afghanistan over the last six years, huge polls, the Taliban never scores more than a 10% favorable, uh, which makes it extremely unlikely that they will come to power in any meaningful way again. Uh, they may get district governorships or provincial governorships, and that's fine if they engage in the conventional political process. And I think elements of the Taliban are in parliament now, Hezbi Islami, which is one of the Taliban groups. But I think our definition of, vi of, of victory, to the extent that we can have one, is that we've, this is kind of a containable nuisance, which are occasionally deadly. Um, but think about the Somali pirates. I mean, once we kind of got ourselves organized around that and we had a lot of countries sort of participating in, in kind of extirpating this problem, I mean, it, it's been largely managed. It's not going to go away. Somalis have no money, and this is one of the few ways you can make money. Uh, and similarly, I think jihadist violence is, is not going to disappear. But, you know, there's, we can just make it less and less relevant over time. I mean, there, there are Marxist-Leninists here in the United States still, but no one pays them any attention. It's, it's, so we, we can't, our standard shouldn't be the total abolition of these ideas that are not useful, uh, because there will always be some takers for bad ideas. Our standard should be, like, have we managed our, our own security and, and, and in such a way that they're unlikely to impact us? And I think we're, we're well past that point. And uh, let me just to give you some examples. You know, on 9-11, on there were 16 people on the no-fly list. Now there are 20,000. On 9-11, the FBI and CIA barely talked to each other. Now they're highly integrated. The FBI almost had no intelligence gathering function before on 9-11. It now has 2,000 intelligence analysts. On 9-11, there were pro perhaps five joint terrorism task forces around the country. Now there are more than 100. On 9-11, there was no TSA. On 9-11, there was no DHS. On 9-11, there was no National Counterterrorism Center. There are now 860,000 Americans with top secret clearances. There are four and a half million with secret clearances. I mean, we created this huge, I mean, you make the argument, you know, it's not only redundant, it's sort of over-redundant, sort of national security apparatus designed to kind of attack this problem. And, you know, it took a long time for the United States to made a lot of mistakes on the way. Um, but, you know, we have kind of learned from our mistakes mostly. Um, and we present an incredibly hard target. And, and one other thing that I hadn't mentioned, very important, public knowledge. Richard Reed, the so-called shoe bomber, was disabled by the passengers in, uh, in the months after 9-11 when he tried to blow up a shoe bomb flight between Paris and Miami. Uh, Abdul Muttalib, the Nigerian who tried to blow up Christmas, uh, the Northwest Flight 253 on Christmas Day 2009, was disabled by the passengers. Um, the guy who tried to blow up an SUV in Times Square on May 1st, 2010, was, uh, it was a street vendor who pointed out to the police that this SUV was smoking, it seemed suspicious. So. All these things add up to making our cut, us, the United States and the West in general, a very hard target. And then you throw into that their own weaknesses and their own lack of successes. I mean, this is a, you know, they, they if, if these are the problems that we should be seriously concerned about, we can sleep very soundly every night. Yeah, on the, uh, on the raid, on uh, the SEAL raid, I can understand the helicopters getting in, but when they were leaving, how come the Pakistani Air Force didn't try to shoot them down? Okay. Um, Mike Leiter, who was head of the National Counterterrorism Center, um, who ran the red team to look at the case that bin Laden was living in Abdubai, was is also a naval aviator. And he was in the room, in the Situation Room, uh, the night of the, of the raid. Um, and because he's a naval aviator, he has a pretty good sense of what it's like. He said, look, trying to find, they, Pakistan has almost no night flying capability. They have F-16s that scrambled. He said, look, trying to find you know, two stealth hel helicopters in a country twice the size of California in the middle of the night, it would be extremely hard if you had just all the assets of the Ameri United States, AWACS and all these other things, looking. Um, th this was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, and certainly the F-16s did scramble, and there was a real concern at the White House that the Pakistanis might interpret this as an incursion by India. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that, you know, there was a lot of people in the White House saying, we need to get on the phone to General Kiani and explain what has happened. And one of the reasons, the reason that President Obama came out that night at 11.35 on a Sunday night, which is not a typical time for a president to have a press conference, is the Pakistanis said to Mullen, you know, Mullen said, look, this is what's happened. 
And, and they said, yeah, we, we understand something has happened. It's clearly, there was a crash. We know about it. It's clearly not one of ours. And Keani said, well, I was like, you need to really get out and explain to our public and what happened, because we can't explain it. This is your operation. And so the pressure mounted for you know, President Obama to go out and, and make it. Obama wanted to wait for 100% confirmation it was bin Laden. He had 95% confirmation because there were two DNA tests. One was a kind of quick down and dirty that gave him 95%. Another one, 36 hours later, gave him, you know, like 100, 100, 100 percent. Uh, so the PACs, they did, tr they did scramble. It was like looking for a needle in a haystack. And the people, obviously the people in the Situation Room who didn't know much about aviation were concerned when they heard that the PACs had scrambled. But, you know, it was a... If you, if you knew about their capabilities, it was extremely unlikely uh, that they would be able to detect the helicopters. Wait, please. It wasn't clear from the movie, but did they have backup helicopters that they brought in? It, yeah. In fact, <laughs> Admiral Mullen was very, very insistent uh, to put on the record the following, which I think is quite interesting, which is Bill McRaven came to the came to the White House with a plan. Um, and what he had sort of internalized from what he'd been told was the plan should be a sort of do not piss off the Pakistanis unnecessarily plan. So calibrate it so it's not going to cause some huge ruckus with them. As President Obama and everybody was talking about this in the planning phases, Obama said, actually, our premium is not going to be not pissing off the Pakistanis. Our premium is getting our guys out. And uh, so Mullen said to me, it was President Obama who basically sort of, there, in any kind of special operations plan like this, there would have been backup. But he heavily, uh, he, he, Obama insisted on more backup. And so they had the two Black Hawks that did the raid. They had two Chinook, you know, uh, bus-sized transport helicopters inside Pakistan in a very remote area, 50 miles north of Abdabad. And they had another Chinook on the Afghan-Pakistan border all of this was quick reaction force, backup, and of course, one th Zero Dark Thirty, for instance, if you, for those who've watched it, there is, it was always bothering me that what the scenes were the Black Hawks, so there are three Black Hawks, which is wrong. There were two Black Hawks, one went down, and then a Chinook came in to pick up, you know, Bin Laden's body, the people, the seals on the ground, uh, the, you know, all the stuff they recovered from the compound, all the intelligence. Uh, so, you know, that, that the operation, you know, the, the backup was required, uh, and, and uh, President Obama had a role in making it, uh, uh, you know, the backup larger. Okay, with this gentleman here. Yes. When you met with uh, Bin Laden and looked into his eyes, what did you see? I s <laughs> well, he reminded me a tiny bit of you. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, no, what did I see? Uh, I, you know, I saw, uh, you know, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't know what I saw. I, uh, you know, because he hadn't done anything when we met with him. He was, you know, threatening and serious and well-informed and he had a lot of guys. And he seemed to be maybe involved in the first attack on the Trade Center in February of 93, which uh, killed six people. But, you know, what, what did we see? We saw, you know, he's very tall, thin, he, well-informed, uh, you know, angry. Um, uh, serious people around him treated him with a lot of deference. They called him the Sheikh. Uh, they were all very heavily armed, RPGs, Russian submachine guns. Uh, you know, I saw somebody who was pretty serious about declaring war in the United States. At the same time, you know, we're sitting in a mud hut in the middle of the night in Afghanistan. It's not at all clear how you implement that war. Um, and the answer came a year later when they blew up two American embassies simultaneously in Africa, in Kenya and Tanzania, killing 200 plus. Uh, uh, Africans and, and 12 Americans, and we lost a huge propaganda advantage. We should have immediately said, since most Kenya and Tanzania are, have very substantial Muslim populations, this is a guy who doesn't care about killing Muslim civilians because probably more Muslims died in these attacks than Americans. Uh, and it was sort of an early indicator of, of kind of their modus operandi. Uh, but so, you know, there was one side of me who said, this guy seems serious, and there's another side of me who says, you know, he hasn't done anything. Uh, in fact, they invited me to come back in 98, and uh, I was like, you know, why, why, we're not going to spend the money, the risk, go to Taliban, control Afghanistan, meet with these guys again to just hear the same old stuff. The reason they invited us back is they had their first and only press conference in May of 1998, in which they kind of subtly signaled that they were going to do something big. 
um, and uh, of course they did. Why don't we take a last question, Peter? Okay, gentleman back. Uh, thanks very much. Fascinating talk a as usual. Um, question: What how, what do we know about where Bin Laden was between Tora Bora and, if I understood you correctly, 2005 when he when he moves into the compound in Abbottabad? And related to that. Um, has the intelligence community, as far as you know, sort of looked back and seen retrospectively, ah, there were, you know, we had clues that might theoretically have led us to bin Laden, you know, during that period, or is that truly just a, a, a blank spot on the, on the, on the timeline? Uh, you know, well, I, I don't know if they've looked back and said, what did we miss, but um, in, in answer to your question, what was he doing, WikiLeaks indicates that he went to Kunar in eastern Afghanistan after the Battle of Tarbar, which makes sense. Everybody would expect him to go in Af to Pakistan. Instead, he doubled back into this very remote area that has no meaningful government and is very heavily wooded. And then his wife gave an interview to Pakistani police officials, which, is, which came out after my book was published, which filled in uh, the years 2002, 2005. He traveled to Peshawar in late 2002. Then he traveled to a city called Haripur in Pakistan and then to Abdabad. He also spent some time in Swat in northern Pakistan. So the whole nine years, he was in Pakistan. Um, also, he had four kids while he was on the run, which is not a typical thing a fugitive would do. Uh, two, <laughs> two of them in the Pakistani hospitals, but you know, it's not like the dad came to the delivery. Uh, <laughs> so. Peter Bergen, thank you so much for an incredibly informative presentation. <laughs>